my father's father came to Bakersfield from Japan probably in 1899 because my father's mother was left in Japan with a, uh, two sons and pregnant. And so my father was born in 1900. He came over to America in 1918. There was a rule that um, older people could no longer come, but if you were called by a parent or a relative, then you could come. And, and as long as you were uh, under adult age, I assume. And so he was, they called that Yobiose. And uh, he came in 1918. So he saw his father for the first time in his life at probably Angel Island or in San Francisco. Well, the, uh, uh, his father worked for the Santa Fe Railroad in Bakersfield uh, cleaning cars. And so that's what my father also did. And then in 19, uh, probably in 1923, there was a new law to be effective in July of 1924, which would exclude anyone from coming to America who was a laborer. And, uh, and so all the young men were told, you've got to get married. This was beyond the time of the picture brides because that was no longer available to them. And so my father had to go back to Japan to marry a young woman who was willing to come over here. And uh, his mother selected my mother. They happened to be first cousins. Their mothers were cousins. Their fathers, my father's, well, actually my two grandfathers were brothers. And so it was easy for them to get married. And so my mother came and uh, got married in Tokyo and uh, got all the papers in May and, and um, came in June of 1924. She landed in Seattle on the ship. And uh, my father, of course, was with her and uh, she was wearing her kimono. Um, very, um, well, her family was a rural uh, farming family, so it was not an elegant kimono. It wasn't one of these silk ones, probably was cotton. But uh, my father decided that she needed an American dress. And so he went out and bought a dress for her. It happened to be wool in June of 1924. And you know Bakersfield's weather. She came down, uh, came south on the train, and she says it was so hot on the train and when she got off in Bakersfield. So that's one of the things, stories my mother related to me. So in Bakersfield, he, uh, began first as a gardener, you know, after he was married, and he learned how to do farming uh, as a migrant laborer. And so he did some gardening for the Standard Oil Company and then moved east of uh, Bakersfield to a farm because people who came from Japan could not purchase land. And of course, he didn't have any uh, children old enough to have uh, the property in their name. So my father never owned land. He always rented. And I learned when my own children were uh, interviewing grandma for about their background, I learned that my father had to pay rent month by month. You could not lease for the year. So he farmed and he was a successful farmer. He grew uh, melons and uh, cucumbers, 
uh, sweet potatoes and yams, and those were the major crops. And the melons, there was one called cassava that you cannot find on the market. It's not like the cassava you find in the stores anymore. It was a white cassava, and I can still taste that delicious cassava. So they were very successful in farming. My mother gave birth to five children. The first four, me being the youngest of that group, were almost their step, almost every year. And then uh, my youngest brother, three years after me. So we grew up in the country uh, outside of Bakersfield. We went into town every Saturday when I was old enough um, for Japanese school and every Sunday for Sunday school. And there were neighbor uh, Japanese families who uh, drove us to those places until my brother was old enough to drive. So. My childhood was very simple. Um, our job, my job, when my mother went to work out in the field, my job was to keep the bath water hot. I think every Japanese family, and around here too, I understand every Japanese family had a bathhouse, a uh, furo. And my job was to get the wood and keep the water so it was nice and hot by the time my family came from the fields in the evening. My other job was to uh, make uh, rice. Of course, we didn't have the electric rice cooker at that time. And what I did was uh, time it by the um, uh, soap opera on the radio. I can't remember if it was Amanda of Honeymoon Hill or <laughs> which one, but I would listen and then I would burn it because I would forget to turn it down soon enough. Anyway, they, we ate well. Um, if we were poor during this uh, depression time, we didn't know it. We had plenty of food that was grown, as well as um, my father always bought those 100-pound sacks of rice. We always had rice. He always bought the oranges in a huge crate. We always had oranges around. So we were very healthy. And uh, we went to school right there in the area uh, took a bus every morning, walked, uh, must have been at least a half a mile to the road, and um, had a very simple life. It was with the bombing of Pearl Harbor that I want to take you to my experience at church. The older people always had a, a church service in the evening. The English service was in the morning. And in the evening, we got together, and a Reverend Dylan Throckmorton from the Trinity Methodist Episcopal Church, I think it was called the ME Church at that time still. Anyway, he came to support us. And then, and that's when I realized there was something special about this bombing. The, of course, war had not started until the next day. And then the next day I went to school on Monday, and one of the first things I remember happened was when we were out on the uh, playground during recess, a girl that I knew from first grade on asked me, why did you bomb Pearl Harbor? That startled me because I said, I didn't bomb it, I was here. But the connection was already made even by a, a seventh grade child. So that's when um, things started to happen without my knowing it. 
My father probably had to go into town to get more information. We did have a phone by then. My brothers, two oldest brothers, went to uh, high school. And they took their bus. My sister and I took the bus to our school, and my youngest brother went to another school, took a different bus again. Otherwise, life went on. We could not travel more than five miles away from our home, and so we no longer went into town for our church. We went to a local Methodist church. Uh, we had to do shopping in the uh, mercantile in Lamont, a small town that had a few stores. And uh, you also were supposed to be in between uh, the time the sun went down, dusk, to dawn. We were supposed to be at home. And so we complied with all that. But of course, I was a 12-year-old child, so I didn't make any uh, decisions in our family. My father probably was, had been uh, talked to by a uh, sheriff's deputy. My brother uh, related that story in his oral history when I uh, interviewed him. I didn't realize that. I was probably just at school. And children don't take those kinds of information to, to uh, make a difference in their life. And it didn't to me, except that now we had to pack up. The um, people in Bakersfield, the Japanese people in Bakersfield, were very fortunate because with the people at Trinity Church and some of the members at First Methodist Church, they formed a committee that was called the Aid to Japanese Methodist Evacuation Committee. And they helped us in taking care of our things at the two churches, not just our Methodist church, but also at the Buddhist church. So everyone stored their things in boxes, labeled everything. And when we finally did go into a post in Arizona, we went directly. We did not go to a uh, assembly center at all. We went on the train from Bakersfield to Parker and on a, I think it was a uh, truck, uh, army truck, over to Poston. Anyway, all of our things were stored. And then that committee, two of the members on that special committee were people who, women who had taught us in Sunday school. Emma Buckmaster was very special to me. 1927, see I was born in 1929, but in 1927 she was told by somebody at First Church, okay, it's your turn to go over to the Mission Church and help them. So she came in 1927 and taught Sunday School to the youngest children. And by the time I was four, I'm sure I was also in her class. And Emma Buckmaster and Lottie Phillips took care of the things in that church building and the Buddhist church building and the little parsonage that was right behind the church. They rented out. They took care of people in town who were able to purchase homes. They took care of those homes as well and made sure that uh, things were paid for when they uh, had to be, rented things uh, when they had to. So this was a very special committee. And I have not heard of another community that had a committee like this. Mm -hmm. Individuals, yes. Lots of individuals. I've heard stories, not just yours, but from many other people how individuals had helped them and stored their things in their barn and, and helped them move and took them to the uh, train. Well, we had a committee who did that. Um, 
And when we came back, that committee was ready to help us too. As people needed things and requested things while they were in the camp in Poston, Emma would send it. In fact, she even sent the Buddhist, uh, whether it was a whole Buddhist or what, I'm not sure, but she sent some Buddhist paraphernalia that they needed to use in Poston. So thanks to Emma Buckmaster and Lottie and the rest of that committee, they were just a godsend for us, both before, during, and after the war. And I was told by one of the members of that committee, he happened to also be my high school history teacher in my junior year, but he said, you know, um, when the House Un-American Activities Committee met, the Trinity Church was put on their list, I guess, because they helped us. So you never know what kind of results will come from people just helping. We came back because my father was able to, although he had some many strokes in camp and he couldn't work. He, when he came back to Bakersfield, he stayed with Emma and uh, he helped to clean up the uh, church as people needed things, as people moved elsewhere from the camp, then they shipped that stuff. And so there was room little by little in the churches and as people came back to the, to the church, they used it as a hostel, both Buddhist and our Methodist church. And uh, thanks to the, these women, we had a place to go to start with. Uh, actually, I didn't live in the church. My parents and younger brother did. I went to the high school which was arranged by my history teacher. And uh, my sister and I came back before our family did. And I was assigned, we were both assigned very popular uh, senior women who were our big sisters that year that um, in 1945-46 because they were already popular and we never had any problems when we went back to school. I've heard other stories of other people, how difficult it was to readjust to school, but we didn't have that kind of problem. My only concern was that I knew that Poston was not an accredited high school and so I took my first year Spanish over again after I had taken it in, in my uh, freshman and sophomore years. I took it again in Bakersfield and I did just fine. <laughs> so I returned to school to my junior year. Back in Bakersfield. To back in Bakersfield at East Bakersfield High School. And then uh, Life went on again. My parents both came back, stayed in the uh, church for a while, and then found some land out in the west side of Bakersfield to farm. Well, with my father's a weak uh, heart, or his problems anyway with the strokes, uh, he was unable to do much farming. And then my brother, who had graduated in camp, in 1945, before war was over, he came back after he had uh, served in the army for a year, and he took over the farm, and he found he was uh, uh, allergic to the olive grove that was right next door, as well as to the squash that they were growing. So he was sneezing all the time, I understand. 
And so my father decided to uh, go into town to uh, build a new nursery. So he went into town, found uh, some land that he wanted to uh, buy uh, with an old house on it, went around the neighborhood. His English was not all that great, but uh, good enough. So, and when he had first come to America, he went to school, elementary school, in the neighborhood where they were living uh, by the train, uh, working for the train. He was in a class with first graders, second, and went up through sixth grade in one year. He was 18. They taught him whatever he needed to learn his English because he knew no English in Japan. And so when he went around, although he had a, his Japanese accent, he went around the neighborhood to get their permission, all the neighbors' permission, to put a nursery in that uh, new lot with the old house. And he got his permission, and I assume he went to the city and he put up a nursery with my brother. And so that was their uh, livelihood. And that's what put me through college. He was uh, told to go to the selective service office because I guess he must, his draft number must have come up during the war. But when he got there, he says that they told him, you've been reclassified. He was no longer considered 1A. Now he was 4C, which means he was considered an enemy alien. Mm -hmm. Although he was born in Denver, he was not given citizens' rights, just like we were not given citizens' rights. No one questioned, except for those three men who said they disagree with the evacuation order, the rest of us, the adults, did not question the fact that the government could take us wholesale and send us to another place, away from our homes, businesses, schools, farms, whatever. So Frank's situation was different, but he was later accepted into the Army, and he served in the uh, Military Intelligence Service, MIS we call it. And uh, he went up to uh, Fort Snelling to learn Japanese. He had learned Japanese as a child. Uh, they went to the Buddhist church in Denver, and he also had gone to Japan in 1937 or 38, 39, someplace in there, a couple, uh, for a couple of years. And he learned Japanese. He says at that time he could read Japanese papers. He can't any longer. I'm sure it's a matter of usage. People have to use it or lose it, as they say. You take anyone my age, or teenagers, they had a great time. And um, my brother, my second brother, was very athletic. And so his pitching and his quarterbacking and such as that was in demand in Poston. He had a great time. But, um, and I just played with my friends went to school with my friends, ate with my friends, sat with my friends. When we ate, we didn't eat with our families. And, uh, and so life went on in camp for young people, and that's how it was for me. Mm -hmm.